Thank you. Everybody knows me as Vula. So, okay. Um, the topic of my presentation is uh, reinforcement, anchorage, and bond slip uh, for UHPC structures. The motivation for uh, the talk is the fact that we see the UHPC materials that were recently only considered emerging materials now becoming uh, implemented in actual structures. And development of reinforcement in, uh, in uh, UHPC materials is obviously one of an essential uh, questions before uh, this design can be fully materialized. So the question that came to my mind, the motivating question was, how does the tensile resilience of the UHPC materials may affect or may strengthen or enhance the bond slip properties of reinforcement embedded in these materials. And the reason why this, uh, this motivation came about is because we know that confinement is a critical parameter that affects bond. In uh, the presence of, no, in the absence of any confinement, we have uh, bond failure occurring by cover splitting. Uh, but we do know that we can change this mode of failure to something that uh, is generally referred to as pull out by the addition of significant amount of cover, by the addition of confinement, by enhancing the development length, by reducing the bar diameter, and by enhancing the fracture energy of concrete. And many of these parameters really are reflected through the tensile resilience of UHPC. So some preliminary tests have shown that when you have UHPC material or the reinforcement is embedded into UHPC material, you can actually develop very high stresses in the reinforcement, even with a very little small cover, about in the order of one bar diameter cover. You can develop fully the, the bar capacity without uh, obtaining splitting failures until very large levels of strain develop. The reason for that, we believe, is because the fibers that are intersecting the crack pass uh, provide hoop resistance, which is what you need in order to develop the bar. And this hoop resistance is reflected by an increased amount of fracture energy embedded in the bond slip law, which is shown in the right-hand side to the bottom part of the slide by the gray area. That's the in increased fracture energy of the reinforcement. And of course, in order to, uh, to embark on an experimental study that would assess uh, bond behavior of bars embedded in UHPC, one needs to address a, a couple of issues, which, is, which are, first of all, how short an embedment length would one have to uh, use in order to claim that they have obtained a local bond? and what kind of a specimen type one would have to consider. And the second question is, of course, a more critical one than the first, because the kind of uh, specimen form and setup seems to affect significantly the kind of bond properties you can obtain. And in order to explore that and resolve the question of what kind of a, of a specimen form one would take, we first embarked on a detailed finite element analysis, nonlinear finite element analysis of the various test setups that are routinely used for bond testing, because we do believe that the shape that we will, the shape of the specimen that will be proposed for bond testing of materials in UHPC should be carefully considered. So some of the specimen forms that were considered were the classical standard pullout test, where you have a cube where the bar is embedded inside, and we know that there are many objections to this kind of test. Then uh, um, another form is to use, again, the same kind of specimen with, with a shorter dimension, shorter, smaller thickness, uh, less that would eliminate the spurious influences that occur due to the specimen form. The eccentric pullout has been also proposed, but then also the BMAN test and other forms of tests have been considered. The model that was used in this analysis was an advanced uh, model, a Mark Coulomb kind of uh, model that uh, considers the interfacial properties between the bar and the concrete. And of course, one quarter, whatever symmetry would allow, 
one quarter of the specimen would be modeled in order to ensure that we have uh, optimum, optimal, uh, optimal use of the computational power. So here are, I, I hope this uh, depicts easily for you the effect. I'll explain what you see. So you see different types of specimens. So you have uh, the, on the top or left the standard pullout with friction at the top where it bears on the steel bar. At the bottom, you have the standard pullout with the Teflon pad so that friction is eliminated. Then next, you see the same friction and non-friction conditions for smaller size uh, cubes, pullout cubes, then the eccentric pullout. At the bottom of the eccentric pullout, you see the typical beam and test that is part of the codes nowadays that are used. And then next, you see the, uh, the alternative, which is the direct tension pullout where the bar is developed in uh, concrete that is actually subjected to direct tension. And the color code is the same throughout. So when you see red in the bars, that represents the stress level that was developed in the bar. So you see, for instance, in the uh, standard pullout, you could reach 350 megapascal stress in the steel bar for 5 dB development. Whereas if in a tension pullout, in a direct tension pullout, the development capacity of the bar would be not exceeding 75 megapascals for the same anchorage length. So this illustrates the effect that the specimen form has on the type of specimen that you, on the on the bond slip law that you will read. And this continues on to illustrate the effectiveness, the, the effect of the transverse confining pressures that are acting on the bar. And again, you see very great differences depending on the specimen form. And here are, uh, this is a very interesting result because it shows you the distribution of bond stresses along the bar. And the most interesting aspect of it is if you look at the demand test and the eccentric pullout test, which are second to last in the column, uh, you see a, a, a radical change of color, which represents different distribution of bond on the two faces of the bar. So on one face of the bar, you have bond stresses going downwards. On the other face of the bar, go, you have bond stresses going upwards. So you, there is a reversal of bond stresses, which confuses completely the issue. So uh, the, the, uh, the outcome of this preliminary analysis that was done in order to conclude in terms of the uh, space, uh, specimen form that we would use showed a significant scatter of results, calculated results in terms of bond capacity of the bars that illustrate the spurious effects of the various test setups that are routinely used to characterize bonds. The lower curve is the one that corresponds to the tension pullout, the direct tension pullout, which is now used for the experimental study that follows. So in the in the conventional method, the direct tension pullout has two bars embedded in concrete, back to back on the same axis. One is the support bar, has a longer anchorage length. The other is the test bar, has a shorter anchorage length, which is the test length. And this has been modified because of with the UHPC, you would end up with a very, very large uh, kind of specimen. So we developed a, a concrete block that is very thin in one direction. That thinness corresponds to the cover thickness that we want to test. In the other direction, the specimen is large enough to avoid tensile failure in concrete. And the, bar, the, the concrete block is held down uh, through uh, a, a device, a hardware device that has been uh, fabricated with the hinge at the bottom. And the bar, the test bar, is being pulled upwards in order to test the development capacity of a short anchorage length, which is only 5 dB in order, based on some analysis that we did, that we did in order so that we are able to say that the value of the force developed by the bar div divided by the contact area gives us a, a good feeling of the local bond strength. So this is the test specimen mounted on the, uh, on the MTS uh, test frame. Uh, the various hardware that we made for adjustment of the specimen are shown to the left. The parameters of the experimental program included the following. We tested, our parameter was the material we tested. We tested uh, four different UHPC materials, rather three UHPC materials and one ECC material. 
Of those three UHP materials, two were commercial, one was in-house made. The cover thicknesses we considered were 1D and 2D. The embedment length, as I said, was five, five, five times the bar diameter. And the bar, we only used one bar for this experimental study, which was 16 millimeter uh, diameter bar. That's the 15M bar in Canada. So the four different mixes that we used, we said uh, that one uh, was a commercial mix with 2% uh, fiber volume, uh, uniform fibers, straight, 13 millimeter long. The other commercial mix contained a cocktail of fibers, same volumetric ratio, but one uh, set or 50% of the fibers were um, straight steel fibers. The other were hooked fibers. Uh, the in-house mix had uh, PVA fibers, and uh, uh, the other in-house mix had also straight steel fibers, but were uh, two and a half percent per volume. Um, all the UHPC materials had a concrete strength, uh, compressive strength around 130 megapascals. The uh, the PVA, the ECC material, had a concrete strength of about uh, 60 to 70 megapascals. The tests were done. Uh, we used uh, both uh, conventional uh, measuring uh, instruments as well as uh, digital image correlation. Uh, in the uh, bottom to the uh, right figure, you see by blue the, the displacement of uh, the concrete, the concrete surrounding the bar. By orange, you see the bar displacement. So the difference between these two and the, uh, the, the force developed uh, divided by the contact area give you the bond, the typical bond slip uh, curve that we obtained from all the various tests that we did. A, a, a few duplicates were done for each typical test. And then, uh, so this is just a sample of the load displacement curves that reflect actually the bond slip curves that we obtained. The, um, we found generally that the specimens with a thicker cover were able to develop much larger bond stresses. And this is the typical bond stress slip loads that we obtain for the bunch of the specimens. You see a large variety of strengths. The upper values correspond to the thicker cover. The lower uh, values correspond to the thinner cover specimens. In terms of force development capacity, the first column First column is the, okay, the specimen ID. The second column gives you the forces developed in the bars in over 5 dB. Uh, note that about 80 kilonewton would correspond to bar yielding. So uh, you see that in some situations, just 5 dB were able to reach almost bar yielding. We didn't yield it, but it was very close. And the bound stresses that developed in this very, very small uh, cover ranged between uh, 9 and 20 almost megapascals. Uh, at the same time, we did a comparison study where the same exactly materials and the same kind of bar, same casting was done on uh, beam bond tests where, again, the development length would only be five times the bar diameter adjacent to a notch where the notch was in the constant moment region controlling the magnitude of the force that we would be inputting in the bar. And what we saw uh, in summary are the following results. The empty uh, symbols in this, uh, in this figure represent the bond stress. Uh, the vertical axis is the bond stress divided by the tensile strength of the material obtained after dog bone testing. The horizontal axis is the ratio of the cover, the clear cover divided by the bar uh, diameter. The empty uh, symbols are those obtained from beam tests. The filled symbols are those obtained from identical mixes from uh, tension pullout tests. You see that the beam tests are systematically well above uh, the, uh, the uh, tension pullout tests leading to an overestimation of the bond capacity of the reinforcement. And here is the same set of data, but now the, the bond strength is divided by the square root of the compressive strength of the respective material. We see that uh, with tension pullout, we have a bond capacity that is in the range of uh, half to one times, uh, to maybe to 1.3 times 
the uh, square root of f prime c, whereas the Beeman tests give a much more, uh, a much higher value of bond, which is in the context of where it is going to be used, it is totally unconservative. And here again, we see the results uh, in comparison between uh, the uh, tension pullout and the beam end tests. So the first column in this table gives you the code names of the specimens. It's, it's really not important. What should be of interest would be the second column, which is a ratio, a ratio of values between the peak bond strength obtained from tension pullout divided by the peak bond strength obtained from identical materials, but from beam tests. We see that the differences are staggering. We go from 9 to 24 for the same kind of material. So there is got to be significant attention paid to what kinds of specimens we are going to be using and introducing in code practices in order to pre-qualify these materials or the bond for these materials. And the slip at peak is around 0.4 to 0.5 for most of the UHPC materials, lower values for ECT materials, but the slip capacity before pullout is really uh, very large, very great. It's in the order of several millimeters. So in conclusions, in conclusion, we find that the UHPC materials provide bond strength that is more than double the values obtained from common concrete. We saw multiple modes of failure appearing simultaneously due to the internal passive confinement provided by the fibers, while microcracking was arrested by the fibers that intercepted the crack paths. Conventional bond test setups generally led to an overestimation of the bond slip response of structural members. These are owing to the spurious influence of either the specimen form of the, or uh, this, the manner of loading. The direct tension pullout test proved to be uh, to be the most conservative, leading to the least possible interfere interference. The UHPC specimens reached bond strengths that were as as high as three and a half times greater than the ECC specimens, and uh, both responses were very ductile in terms of slip. The direct tension pullout specimens with cover thickness of two dB exhibited noticeably higher bond strengths than the equivalent specimens with 1 dB. And uh, the uh, slip amount uh, that corresponding to, to peak uh, strength really depended from what we saw afterwards by cutting the specimen on uh, the fiber distribution and uh, the fiber density. Thank you.